Well, Dave Takes It On travels the country, visiting charges so you can plan your charging sessions or routes much easier. But I do sometimes forget that some of my viewers do not yet have an EV, and many might be wondering whether or not to buy a Tesla. Is it different? Is it better? How much do they charge you to charge? And how do you start a charging session? How powerful are they? Also, for those who have decided on a non-Tesla, maybe a Mercedes or BMW or Hyundai or MG, are Tesla superchargers still important to you? If so, why? And how do you use them? I'm Dave, and today I offer my guide to all things Tesla supercharger, whatever you decide to buy or already drive. It's valid for all EVs, whatever the brand or model. Now, for those of you who know some of this, but you have a specific question, I've included chapters, so please feel free to skip to whichever section is relevant to you personally and the car you've chosen. Also, if you do already know all this, or maybe you're not yet ready to get your first EV, just bookmark this video so you can return to it, or so you can pass the link on to someone you know who also has these questions. So we're going to start with just a very quick history. Elon Musk instantly realised when he was building up Tesla Motors that nobody in the right mind would buy his EVs in any numbers unless they could do a road trip. Other legacy auto manufacturers just washed their hands of the problem. We don't build petrol stations, they stated. Others do that, so we shouldn't have anything to do with building chargers. Just let others do that. They did throw a few pounds into the kitty. Well, the range of EVs even today is usually less than the equivalent petrol or diesel car, so recharging on the road was always absolutely necessary to, to, to some, those who do regular road trips, and also vital to those who can't charge at home. Well, Tesla, right at the beginning, decided to build their own exclusive, massive ultra-rapid EV charging network. First, so that those who did road trips could do them with ease, as long as they drove a Tesla, and secondly, because it would drive more people to buy Teslas than any other brand that didn't bother building their own networks. So the Tesla network instantly became both the largest and fastest EV charging network in the world and remains so. In fact, ever more increasingly so to this day. Well, history over, I said it was going to be quick. When average Tesla supercharger today anywhere in the world has typically between 12 and 24 charger bays, each with an ultra-rapid 150 or 250 charger, so dwarfing the feeble attempts of all other private EV charging networks, Osprey, Instavolt, Ionity in the UK, and Electrify America, EVgo and ChargePoint in the States, most of which have just a handful, two, four or six chargers per location and lower power typically maxing out at about 150 kilowatts, but most are actually much nearer 50. That, by the way, is slowly starting to change and more powerful 300, 350 kilowatts are appearing, and sometimes in greater numbers, Hit over here up to 12 per location. Well, by way of contrast, several superchargers now have in excess of 100 bays of ultra-rapid chargers in a single location, a feat that is still unique in the world. Here in the UK, we now have several massive superchargers with up to 32 bays of 250 kilowatt power, not shared. Well, three final decisions made them even more desirable and apply to this very day. First, the operation of the chargers was made effortless. It was just built into every Tesla car. So the chargers needed no apps, no contactless, no payment, no RFID, no screen. People just plug in and they're instantly linked to Tesla HQ and that already has their car ID, the charger ID, the driver ID, and the stored payment card, debit or credit. Well, second, their reliability was an absolutely superb, and it still is today. They make all their own chargers and look after them with a dedicated team of engineers constantly on the road. Reliability was, and still is, in excess of 99.99%. The third, they make charging your Tesla cheaper than anyone else in every country, accepting any special offers made by other networks from time to time, like you get three months free charging at Ionity when you buy a new car. Well, today that has changed dramatically as Tesla is now rapidly opening its exclusive network of superchargers to non-Tesla EVs and drivers. Instantly, all the scare stories that the mainstream media and clickbait YouTube channels promote just disappear. 
Not enough charges? Try finding 28 at one motorway services at Rugby. Always broken? No, these are 99.99% working nationwide. Not anywhere near me? <laughs> Not anymore. Tesla today has the world's largest network. The numbers are still growing rapidly and some areas are better than others, but there is almost always one reasonably close and always more than one on all major road and motorway routes. The one exception, AC chargers. Tesla to this day do not operate any public 7 kilowatt or 11 kilowatt chargers. They obviously do home chargers. We'll look at all the true scare stories about broken chargers and not enough out there, running out of power, getting stranded, etc. It's easy to forget what Tesla actually offers and why them opening up their superchargers to non-Teslas is such a massive deal. So back to basics once again. What do Tesla drivers get in the way of supercharging when they buy their first Tesla? And then follow quickly by what do non-Tesla drivers need to do to use them? Well, as most Tesla chargers were exclusive to Tesla owners, all the chargers up till September 2023 had no screens, no controls, no contactless. They had a plug and a cable. That was it. And the cable was really short, designed so that every Tesla had the charging point on the left rear and every supercharger station had the charger on the left rear when you reversed in. And every charger until 2019 had dual cables, one with a CCS2 plug, one with a Tesla proprietary plug. Looked a bit like a Type 2 AC plug. That's over here in the UK and Europe. America was and still is a bit different. I'm not going to go into that now. All Tesla cars can charge at a V1 or a V2 station, as they each have both the early Tesla proprietary Type 2 like plugs and CCS2. But V3s onwards no longer have the Type 2 plug. V3s and the new V4s only have CCS2. All Tesla Model 3 and Model Y have only CCS2 socket, so they can use any charger ever made by Tesla. But the Model S and X sold in limited numbers. It had only the Type 2 light socket, so I cannot charge at a V3 or a V4 without an adapter. That's a simple plug. It's an adapter that turns a CCS2 side of the plug to a Tesla Type 2 type. It's really simple and quick. For non-Teslas, the early chargers V1, V2 and V3 all had CCS2, as did virtually all EVs built before 2017, and many built before this. They had a problem when they tried to charge as the charger points on most other EVs, Mercedes, BMW, Hyundai, others like that, were often not at the left rear and the short cable didn't reach, whether they reversed in or drove in forwards. And most solved this by pulling into one bay but then having to use the cable and plug from the adjacent charger. That was effectively blocking two chargers to charge one non-Tesla car. Well, to allow non-Tesla owners to use the old chargers, all with CCS2 plugs, but without screens and contactless, Tesla launched a free to download app. You run this app, input a credit or debit card, which is stored, and any EV can operate the charger and session from the smartphone. So non-Tesla cars can now charge at many Tesla superchargers. There are some older superchargers that are already so popular and busy that opening these up would cause horrendous queuing to all EVs. So these are, remain exclusive to Tesla, and I believe they probably always will do. So Tesla launched the V4 chargers just a few months ago, hailed as future-proof, a bit more on that later, and all new installations will now feature this charger. You will still find some new installation of the V3s, a bit like Birch services on the M62, but these were installed months ago and they've just been awaiting grid connection until a few weeks ago when work started up again. They'll open up before Christmas. New chargers are now all of the V4s and these have a really neat LCD screen, an equally neat and stylish contactless terminal and a long 4 metre cable that can reach almost every car, front, back, side, rear, wherever it is. Doesn't matter if you pull in forwards or backwards. The V4 chargers now give EV drivers a triple choice. For Tesla drivers, well, we just use them like we've always used them. Just plug in to start, unplug to finish, payment taken automatically as you drive off. No change for us. For non-Teslas, you have a choice. You can download and use the Tesla app, like with the V1, 2 and 3 chargers. Or now you can just use the contactless on the V4s and no app at all. This contactless is exactly like filling up with petrol at supermarket pumps. You swipe your card, fill up, replace the nozzle, drive away. Really easy. 
Tesla also offers a membership. The lowest, ridiculously cheap prices have previously only been available to Tesla owners, but with the V4s, non-Tesla drivers now have a choice. For occasional use, yeah, you can find Just Use contactless. No app, no store card, no details, no turn, just turn up, swipe, charge, drive off. For regular users, though, a membership is offered, $10.99 a month, which drops the prices at all Tesla superchargers down to the same that all the Tesla drivers already get. It's around about 25% discount. It's not compulsory. You do not need a membership, but it makes massive sense to anyone who charges more than once or twice a month at a Tesla supercharger. There's an example of this at the end of this video. For a non-Tesla driver at a V1, 2 or 3 charger, they simply pull up with a charger port nearest to the charger. That may still require you to park in one bay and then use the next bay's cable and plug. Uh, there is nothing you can do about this. Try to avoid doing this when the supercharger is heaving busy. Then you'll have to use the app. These have no screens or contactless. Just open the app, select the location, select the charger number, which is always clearly written on the front. Open your charging port flap, plug in and click start charging on the app. Charging will normally start within a few seconds. At the end of the session, when you have as much as you need, just click stop charging on the app and the charging session will stop. Followed shortly by a loud click showing that the plug is now unlocked and can be withdrawn and replaced back in the holder on the charger. Payment is then taken automatically. Now if the session fails to stop or stops and you cannot release the plug, you can usually do so from the app. Click stop charging, then click unlock charger port. Now if that fails, then go into your car and on the display there will be an option somewhere in there to disconnect the plug. Click that. It's exceedingly rare to find a plug that locks that cannot be unlocked from one of these methods. And as a last resort, almost all EVs of every make have a manual release, a pull cable fairly near to the flap. You can find the location of that in your handbook that came with your vehicle. In a last resort, use that. Now sometimes a particular non-Tesla model will have its own unique method of charging at a supercharger. Maybe you have to reverse the process, plugging in and paying instead of paying and plugging in, etc. Try a few. Once you've found it, it'll probably work with all V1, V2 and V3 chargers and just keep using it. Now the V4 chargers are different in that the non-Tesla drivers now have a choice. They can just turn up, swipe and charge with no app, no card details stored, and that suits many people. Just follow the instructions, the charging session is easy. Alternatively, they can use the app. In fact, if they are members, then they will need to use the app to get their membership discount. Now, using the app is the same as on the V1, V2 or V3. Simply select the charger location, select the charger as a number. But as a member, it will then automatically recognise your membership and reduce all your prices accordingly. You end the session in the normal way. Well now, when you're thinking of buying or leasing an EV, I hope you realise that almost the entire Tesla supercharger network is open to all Tesla owners and using it is as simple as it could possibly be. For non-Tesla owners, much of the existing supercharger is already open to you and nearly all future ones will likely to be added as a matter of course. This is happening at an incredible pace. For non-Tesla owners, the supercharger network is a great bonus. And also, if your non-Tesla manufacturer offers you an initial offer, for example, free charging at Ionity for a set period of time, or free or discounted membership rates at another network like BP Pulse, you'll be able to choose the best car for you, but still get free or cheap charging, which might be included as a bonus. I do always warn people, beware if the network you're offered at a discount or free has no charges anywhere near where you live and work, it'll be almost worthless. For example, if you live in North Wales and you're offered free Ionity charging, your nearest charger could be well over 70 miles away. By the time you get back home, your battery's about half full and you need to just turn around and use that half to get back to Ionity. Also beware that a BP Pulse membership for free, offering a healthy discount might sound attractive, but in reality could still mean charging at a much dearer price than a non-Tesla member using a V4 
or the Tesla free app at a nearby Tesla supercharger. All that glitters is not gold. Finally, just how much cheaper is a Tesla supercharger to Tesla drivers and non-Tesla drivers using either the free app and contactless or by joining as a member? Well, a bit complicated, Tesla operates a different price, although usually only slightly different, at different charges throughout the country and also offer different rates, peak and off-peak. So unlike Instavolt at 85p or grid at 69p everywhere every time, Tesla offers no such simplicity. So, here goes. What I've done, I've taken a random selection of superchargers scattered around the country, some exclusive, some open to all, and looked at the peak, off-peak, and sometimes they offer super off-peak rates, uh, and averaged them all out. Now, the actual rate you pay may be slightly different from these figures, just like petrol will vary between supermarket and branded petrol forecourt. Starting with Tesla drivers, they'll pay an average peak price of 45 pence per kilowatt hour, an off-peak rate of 36 pence per kilowatt hour, and if you can find one, a super off-peak rate of as low as 24 pence a kilowatt hour. Look out for these. On non-Tesla drivers who are non-Tesla members at a Tesla supercharger open to all, can expect to pay around 65 pence peak rate, 46p off-peak rate and about 35p super off-peak rate. Non-Tesla drivers but Tesla members can expect to pay around 47 peak, 35p off-peak and 26p super off-peak plus of course the 10.99 a month. So finally here's an example. Pull into Banbury Retail Park, you have a choice of Osprey 150 kilowatt chargers at 79 pence all day all year, no membership, no discount. 20 yards away, it's a Tesla V3 supercharger offering peak rate 64p, off peak rate 49p, and members can pay 10.99, get rates of 47p peak and 36 off peak. So, a real world example single charge of 50 kilowatt once a week at Osprey costs 50 kilowatt hours times 79p is £39.50 per session, anytime day or night, that's 158 a month. Single charge once a week for a non-member, the Tesla supercharger costs a peak time 50 times 64p or £32 a session, so £128 a month. Off peak, non-member, that reduces to 50 times 49p or £24.50 per session, £98 a month. As a member, you pay £10.99 per month plus £23.50 per peak session, £104.99 a month. The member pays 10.99 and 18 pence a session off peak, so 82 pound 99 per month. Well, you do the maths for yourself. Well, for the future, the V4s are hailed as future-proof. They've not specified what or how, but I take this to mean that they can be upgraded from their current 250 kilowatts at 400 volts to 350, and probably well beyond, probably above 500 kilowatts if the demand is there. Being software restricted, a change from 250 to 350 could possibly be done at the flick of a switch from back at headquarters. Likewise, if the 800 volt architecture takes off and the demand is there in the future, then these also will probably be able to choose automatically between 400 and 800 volts, depending on what plugs in. Well, charging above 500 kilowatts and above 800 volts is not yet on the horizon. Some predict that will never be. Look at 4K TVs. They were once the pinnacle of technology, but now quite old hat. But the latest 8K screens are hardly making an appearance, let alone an impact. The difference, according to some experts, is that we're now reaching the resolution of human sight. So a doubling from 4K to 8K does not double what we see in terms of discernible quality. Why would anyone pay £10,000 if there's little difference? The future of 4K TVs looks likely to be much better 4K TVs for the future. And the future of EV charging could well be better 250 kilowatt, 350 kilowatt, or maybe 500 kilowatt chargers, rather than stretch it out to 1000 kilowatt mega chargers. Thanks for watching, I'm Dave.